John chapter 17. That's your assignment to read that every day this week. We are not going to touch John 17 today. We're going to talk about prayer. And John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. Now somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know, no, no, no. The Lord gave what we call the Lord's Prayer that's really a model prayer. Remember the disciples said, teach us to pray, and he laid out this model, and somehow we put the tag on it, the Lord's Prayer. You want to really hear the Lord's Prayer, you go to John 17, and look at how he prayed for us, and gave us an example of how we need to be praying for our world, and I want you to read that every day this week. That's going to be good for you in connection with what we're doing here today. Youth for Christ across the country is sponsoring a week of prayer on behalf of youth. You have a blue insert in your bulletin that I want you to take on home with you. I want you to read it now because I want to preach to you right now. And you get to reading, you won't hear what I'm saying and you'll miss some wonderful things because I got some good things to say to you that you need to, to get a listening on. As I was with H the other day and he was talking about this program and what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and encouraging us as a bunch of pastors to become a part of it. And we accepted that responsibility. This morning as I was coming to the church from my radio broadcast, I pulled up to the corner of Fruit and Barstow and I thought I recognized that car and waiting at the traffic light and I looked over and there's G.L. Johnson. Now he always listens to me and I rolled my window down and said, hi G.L. And he said, that sounds like a voice I just heard on the radio. Because while he's getting ready, he listens to my broadcast and he said, thanks for pushing the prayer week. I want to call you and talk to you about some things we're going to be doing in our place. Pastors all over the area, little churches, big churches, medium-sized churches are doing things about it. And you see, we talk about the fact that prayer is the greatest weapon we can use. And when we think about the theme of pushing back the darkness, people, the darkness is so fierce. But you think, how do I push it back? How do I get a handful of darkness and push it back? I can't do that except with one item, and that item is prayer. And we talk about prayer and say we believe in prayer, but if we were to lock the doors in this building right now and say we're not going home until everybody stands up and gives an honest report on how much they prayed last week. And anybody who lies is going to go blind in one eye. Boy, I tell you what, folks, we talk about it, but we don't do it. And there is no other means that we can use that will accomplish what needs to be accomplished on behalf of the young people in Fresno and Madera counties. Listen to these statistics. These are not Youth for Christ. These come out of our county, Fresno County. Alcohol, 77% of our junior and senior high school students use alcohol. 27% are moderate to heavy drinkers. 27% of our junior and high school kids. Jim Maloney sat back here in the uh, early service. Jim runs the Alcoholism Council. I'm a part of his board. We have on our staff a number of young people in their 20s who work directly with high school kids in relation to the problems of drugs and alcohol. It's a big field. 45 to 60 percent of all fatal accidents involving teenagers are alcohol related. Drugs. These are our stats, people. 63% of all high school seniors in our community have used marijuana. 25% have used cocaine. Now, I know this crowd. You're sitting out there saying, come on. 
You wouldn't know. You, the last time you saw cocaine was on some cop show you were watching and they broke in a place and caught a bunch of people. You have no idea what's happening. And 25% of our high school seniors in this community have used cocaine. Teen suicide continues to increase. The percentage grows of kids who just decide this world doesn't have any place for me. They don't care about me. I'm going to hang it up and get out. It's my only solution is to get out. And that figure continues to go up. In Fresno County, each year and growing, 3,600 teenage girls get pregnant. That's 300 a month. That's 10 a day getting pregnant. All of this talk about safe sex and selling condoms everywhere in the world, and there's still 10 a day getting pregnant. We just had our, our granddaughters visit us from down in Texas. They're 11 and 13. Our 11-year-old granddaughter told us that a girl in her class had a baby this year. This is going on, folks. Dropouts. Kids get tired of school and the pressure and the push. Hang it up and get out. I've got some stats here that I want to read to you from Newsweek. This is a special issue, summer fall of 1990. And it's entitled, A Much Riskier Passage. You see, whenever it was you went to high school, how many high school kids are here? Huh? Huh? There's a bunch of them right down here and a bunch of them hanging out over there. How many of you went to high school 10 years ago? Let me see your hands. 20, 30, 40, 50. I'm gonna tell you what, folks. It's a completely different ball game today. Totally different. Listen to what this has to say. According to a 1989 survey of high school seniors in 40 Wisconsin communities. Now, what do you think about you think Wisconsin? You think cheese and dairy farms and forests and lakes. 40 Wisconsin communities surveying the high school seniors. Global concerns including hunger, poverty, and pollution emerged last on the list of teenage worries. They're not concerned. What's first? Getting good grades and good jobs. If I get good grades, I can get a good job. And the world may be polluted and be totally out of business. Big deal. I'm not concerned. As a generation, today's teenagers face more adult strength stresses than their predecessors did. That's you and me. They face more than we did at a time when adults are much less available to help them. With the divorce rate hovering near 50% and 40 to 50% of teenagers living in single parent homes headed mainly by working mothers, teens are on their own more than ever. Now folks, one of the reasons why we have not only a strong youth staff and we have a number of people in that youth staff because we care about kids. Children, junior high, high school, college and career. Mitch and his crowd are up there at Hume Lake having a big conference this weekend. Our gang has just gotten back from a beach blast a week down there. Shuler, how'd it go? You went on that thing. I talked to Bob just before he left. He, he's got a little time off work because of a, an operation on his wrists. He said, my wrists are fine, but I still have some time coming and I'm going and going to have my own little bunch of kids for a week. Junior high, doing their thing. We believe in that, but we also have a full-time man here in charge of salt groups. Those are our small groups. And singles. When you begin to understand the difficulty, and you can't do it unless you get close enough to somebody who can tell you what it's like, to be a working mother trying to raise a couple of kids. And how it cuts down your time 
to spend with your kids because you go to work and you're bushed when you get home and still there's dinner to fix and clothes to wash and iron and kids to listen to and all of the wearing factors and we need somehow to work together. That's part of why we put together this Rainbows program that Lynn Reinhold's putting together. It's a program designed to help those kids cope with a situation they didn't create. Studies indicate that young people are shaped more by their parents than by their peers. They're shaped more by their parents than their peers, that they adopt their parents' values and opinions to a greater extent than anyone realized. These real realizations are emerging just when the world has become a more dangerous place for the young. They have more access than ever to fast cars, fast drugs, and easy sex. And the statement of this article is, quote, a bewildering array of options, many with devastating outcomes. Among young people, drinking and smoking rates remain ominously high. Sexual activity continues to increase. A recent poll suggests that most teens are regularly having sexual intercourse by the 11th grade. Now you don't believe that. You just hear it. Parents are generally surprised by this data. A lot of parents say, well, not my kids. You just don't think it's happening. And yet clearly it is. Around half a million teenage girls give birth every year in spite of all of the ads and all of the pressure for safe sex and you can buy a condom anywhere in the country. Half a million teenage girls are giving birth to babies. George Will is an outstanding, born-again Christian political writer out of Washington, D.C. You've seen him on some of the uh, lineups and crossfire and that kind of thing. He wrote an article July 30th of 1990 in Newsweek entitled, America's Slide into the Sewer. And he makes this kind of disclaimer. I regret the offensiveness of what follows. However, it is high time adult readers sample the words that millions of young Americans are hearing. And I'll not read all of it to you, for if I did, you'd tar and feather me, run me out, get up and walk out. But I will tell you this, that if you want a copy of this that comes out of Newsweek from the 30th of July, I have made some copies that are on the front desk and you can have one to take it home. And to get the impact of this article, that's what you need to do. And we're prepared to make as many copies as we need. We've already given away a slug of them. I just want to read part of this to you. He says, which words are lyrics? Which are testimony? In a Manhattan courtroom, testimony continues in the trial of young men accused of gang rape and other sadistic violence against the Central Park jogger in last April's wilding episode. Quote, we charged her and we got her on the ground. Everybody started hitting her. And she's on the ground and everybody's stomping and everything. I grabbed one arm and this other kid grabbed one arm and we grabbed her legs and then we took turns getting on her. End of quote. They did it for fun, for entertainment. Quote, and this is a question asked by one of the attorneys. After she was hit on the head with the pipe, did someone take her clothes off? Yeah. Okay, who took her clothes off? All of us. Did somebody have sex with her? Yeah. Did a lot of people have sex with her? Yeah. When arrested, a defendant said, quote, it was something to do, it was fun. We'll ask this question. Where can you get the idea that sexual violence against women is fun? From a music store, through Walkman earphones, from boom boxes blaring forth the rap lyrics, of Two Live Crew. Two Live Crew is the name of one of those groups that's been in the newspapers a great deal recently. You read a little bit of it. If I went on to read the words to the songs that, new, that Two Live Crew does, you would really get upset. But it's here in this article. He puts in little blank spaces, but you don't have to be a Harvard graduate to figure out what the words are. They're out there in the street every day. He makes a couple of other statements. 
He said, media coverage was characterized by coy abstractness, by obscuring mist of mincing, supercilious descriptions of the lyrics as explicit or outrageous or challenging or controversial or provocative. Well now, provoking what precisely? And he comes on down the line and says this. He says, when journalism flinches from presenting the raw reality and instead says only that two live crew's lyrics are, quote, explicit and controversial and provocative, there is an undertone of approval. America today is capable of terrific intolerance about smoking or toxic waste that threatens trout. But only a deeply confused society is more concerned about protecting lungs than minds, trout than women. We legislate against smoking in restaurants while singing that song that they do entitled Me So Horny is a constitutional right. Secondary smoke is carcinogenic. Celebration of torn vaginas, vaginas is mere words. Now there's much more that Will says in this. But when he says a confused society that protects lungs more than minds and trout more than women. That's where we are, people. It is no fun to preach this message. Just get that straight in your mind. I'd rather preach a hundred other messages. But if I believe in young people, and I do, if I believe in the people that are involved in Youth for Christ and in varsity and Fellowship of Christian Athletes and Young Life, the people who are committed to working with young people, then I have a responsibility to stand in this pulpit from time to time and make some declarations that wake up a congregation to what the need is out there for us to be people of prayer. Most of us in this room wouldn't do a good job as a youth worker. We'd run and hide. A 30 minute trip to a high school campus, we'd run away. I am grateful that our workers that work with us in this church have legal authority to be on junior high school and high school campuses because that's where you meet the kids. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that we have demonstrated enough trustworthiness that we are allowed to do that and to meet with our kids and to encourage them along the way. But when I think about what we need to be doing in pushing back the darkness, I think of four verses of scripture that I want to share with you this morning and then I want to make you an assignment to go with John 17 that really makes some demands on us as a congregation this week. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, talking about prayer, the Apostle Paul says, pray all the time. Ask God for anything in line with the Holy Spirit's wishes. Plead with him, reminding him of your needs, and keep praying earnestly for all Christians everywhere. He says three things about prayer. It should be constant, it should be intense, and it should be unselfish. There's nothing selfish about praying for your needs. Don't get the notion, well, I, I, I couldn't do a selfish thing like that. I ought not to come to God and tell him about my needs. Don't be so foolish. That's the place you better be. And that's the place you better begin to function. In strong prayer, praying all the time, staying in that attitude of prayer, and working strongly in that. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. He says, in the same way, that is by our faith, the Holy Spirit helps us with our daily problems and in our praying. For we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how to pray as we should. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with such feeling that it cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows, of course, what the Spirit is saying as he pleads for us in harmony with God's own will. In the 8 o'clock service, Mike Reinhold is here to read and pray. He did a wonderful job. But in the middle of his prayers, he was praying about the Middle East. And he's, he was kind of attacking that subject from first one angle and then another. And, and finally he just said, Lord, we don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray about the Middle East. 
If I don't know, I don't think you know. Not because I'm smarter than you are, but this is my life and my responsibility to give direction to people. All I know how to do is lay that thing out before the Lord and the Holy Spirit. I don't have to say, Holy Spirit, please do. He will do his work. He goes to work every day and never takes off. He will do his work if I will come and lay out as best I can the situation and say, Father, here are these people. I think of people in this church that have kids that are down the Persian Gulf today. I've talked to them. I don't have a kid down there. But I'll tell you something. You talk to those parents, those grandparents, and listen to the pain in their voice because they don't know what's going to happen. When you're dealing with an eccentric madman, there's no way to know what's going to happen. And all these experts that make their little speeches don't amount to diddly in regard to the reality of life because you just don't know where the next move is. That's part of why we need to be praying for one another and for that situation and talking to God about it. And in the same way, we need to be praying for the young people around us and you don't know how to pray, but I want you to do something. I want you, when you drive by a school this week, to say, God, I don't know who's teaching. I don't know who the principal is. I don't know what's happening in there, but I just want to remind you, Lord, one of the great needs of this country is young people knowing something about the things of God and seeing some strong role models in teachers and in other kids. Hobby said, our kids are looking forward to going back and sharing their faith. That's courage. It's a, it's a difficult spot to be. But I'm praying that the youth of this church will give tremendous leadership in the area of bringing people to Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Boy, that's just the opposite of where we are. Why pray when you can worry? That's where so many of us are. Don't worry about anything. That's a command, people. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You can't fix one thing by worry. Might change the color of your hair. Might put a few more wrinkles in your face if there's room. If you're a worrier, you may have it all filled up with wrinkles already. Pray about everything. And when you begin to take that and say, God isn't exaggerating when by his spirit he speaks to us through his word. I better learn to be a person of prayer. And then finally in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, don't be weary in prayer. Keep at it. Watch for God's answers and remember to be thankful when they come. Keep at it. Don't be weary. Now here's your assignment to go with John 17. Get out in the olive patio when we dismiss this service and get your directory. And then when you get home this week, here's the assignment. You open this thing up and start looking at the pictures, okay? And when you're looking at the pictures, you see folks in here that are in here in families. And kids' names are in here. And you look at Keith and Jackie Stewart, and you say, they're Darren and Kimberly. And you talk to God about Darren and Kimberly. It's important to pray over these kids by name while you're looking through this thing. You look at John and Annie Sorter and you say there's Shannon and Brian and Taryn and you begin to talk to God about those three kids by name. And you start in this book and you start working your way on through. Say Dennis and Kathleen Schmidt and there's Heidi and Katie. I want to pray for them. Pray for Heidi and Katie especially. I want you to start at the front. Oh, I don't expect you to do this all day. I expect you to get through this this week. Get on your knees and get this open and start over here.
pray for little Alex Acre. I married his mom and dad. They're great friends of mine. Pray for Alex. And just start working your way through this book and where you see their kids. Boy, there's Mike and Lisa Alfheim and there's Brendan in that picture. He's just a little guy. People, we got to pray for the little guys and the little gals. Any kid that's in this book, I want you to pray for them by name. And I want you to work your way through. And let's work our way through and get to the end of the pictures before the week is over. And you better look how many pictures there are and decide you got to put yourself on a schedule. But get through. You may decide later to pick it up and get on it again. And you may start looking around and finding some folks and saying, you know, I never knew you. But you're Mike and Lisa, aren't you? Been praying for you and your kids by name. You may find yourself getting a little closer to the church family because you get into prayer on behalf of this crowd. And the second thing I want you to do is make some lists of people that aren't in here. Make lists of, of neighbor's kids. Boy, I got a little family up the block from me, the Irbys. They're coming here now. They got three little guys, Brandon and Brian. Bradley and Brian and Blaine. Boy, they're going to need a lot of prayer. I tell you. Fun kids. But man, alive, they need to be surrounded by prayer. Make a list of those kids in the neighborhood and, and of your grandchildren whose pictures aren't in here. And you kids. Get some lists of your classmates and get them written down. When a list where you got them, some acquaintances. And start talking to God off those lists. See, God isn't worried if you pray with your eyes open. Okay, I peeked at a list. Did you see that, Gabriel? Whap them a good one. They got to get their eyes closed. I did a deal. Open your eyes and figure out where you're going in your prayer. People... Hundreds and thousands of people across Fresno County praying for young people and for teachers and for administrators can make a difference. If I didn't think it would make a difference, I wouldn't bother you with a sermon. I wouldn't even remind you of the darkness, let alone talk about pushing it back. But I believe we make a difference. When we attack this thing, with the tool that God gave us, prayer and standing on the promises of his word. Bow with me, will you please? Our Father, accept our thanks this morning. Our thanks for the privilege of particularly honoring our young people and our workers, whether they're youth pastors, intern staff, volunteer workers, Or whether we're talking about teachers, and administrators, principals. God, the volume of prayer will make a tremendous difference. Give us the courage to go and pick up that directory. And then begin, before we go to bed tonight, to get started on a program of prayer on behalf of the children represented in this congregation. How we thank you, Father, that we have this great privilege. And we are trusting you that we will move confidently to the throne of grace on behalf of others who need our loving care. And so bless us, dear God. And I'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now don't go away, don't go away, don't you dare go away because we got a little yellow slips and I got two things I need to hear from you. Mary needs some workers in the children's department. If you just say, I'm willing to be a worker and will fill out a card, 
Put your name. You're a visitor. You got one side. You're regular. Just fill out the other side with your name and all. And write on there, I want to help teach. Mary will call you. Believe me, she'll call you. Or I want to help with Awana on Wednesday night. She'll call you. Get that done. If you've got a spiritual need, let us help you by filling this out and turning it in. We will process this card and we will find a way to help you this week if you'll just let us know what that need is. And then I want to push you one more time. I would hate for you to miss the opportunity to be a part of Choices because you didn't get signed up today. Today's the day, folks, because I'm afraid that most classes are going to be full by the time this day is over. I was afraid that might be true before I got to the 11 o'clock hour. There's still some room. No room in the couples class. No room in the college and career classes. But those other classes, there's room. The men's class, 545 on Wednesday morning with Bill McGlasson. Great teacher. Just going to be a good time, and I hope you get signed up. Pass those little yellow slips to the center aisle, and the men are picking them up. And uh, just know that I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day tomorrow. I hope you labor a little on Labor Day. That list of chores that needs to be done, that you've been saying next holiday, this is the next holiday, friend. Get those little washers changed from those leaky faucets and the screens that need to be cleaned. You know, do all the stuff. Labor Day. Get it done. God bless you. Wonderful to be with you. Now, don't run over the, the guys in the center aisle. You guys on the end, you can go. You've already passed up. But you sit in the middle here. You have to wait and let those fellows get on through. Thanks. God bless you.